of the Father. Yes. The will of the Father. And if you would turn with me to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14 verse 32. Hallelujah, Jesus. Mark, during the circumstances of his writing, he preached the works of Jesus. And I believe that when Jesus shows up in our hearts, there's a work that comes forth. There's a work that is done. He doesn't only just take us and place us into Christ, but he wants to reveal himself on a daily basis to us. Hallelujah. And one of the things that the Lord revealed to me personally is as my father. And he wants to do it for all of us with an unfailing love. Yes. A love that never fails. A love that never gives up. A love that never runs dry. Um, personally, I lost my own father to cancer when I was 18. And it was the hardest thing that I had ever went through. And I'm not going to tell you I did the right thing because I wasn't saved at the time. So I did not do the right thing. And I ran from the Lord and I was angry with the Lord for a really long time until I surrendered my heart to the Lord. And the Lord began to show me that he was my father yes. and that he loved me. And I also have um, my stepdad who's been with me since I was two and I love him. Um, beyond a shadow of a doubt, he's an amazing man. So if he watches this, I love you and happy Father's Day. But the Lord wants to reveal himself to us as his children, yes. as our father, Amen. as a forgiving father, as a loving father, as a merciful father. But sometimes when we're pressed in circumstances, we can't always see the character of our loving father right. because the circumstances taint what we're going through. And all of a sudden we can't necessarily see the character of God. But I want to encourage you this morning that God is at work and that we serve a mighty father, that we serve a powerful father, that we don't just serve a natural father, we serve a father that can break bondage and that wants to set his children free from bondage. We serve a father, and I can say this, um, I talked to Scotty this morning and I told him I was going to use this, but I was at IKC and one of the children that grew up from like this old is now a helper at IKC. And he's in love with the Lord. He was called God on his life. And he yes. said, you know, Ange, I used to watch my father go up in the prayer room. He goes, and every, every other Saturday he would go in the prayer room and he would stay there all day. All day in the presence of God. He said, and I was young, so he said I would sneak in as his son and he would be down on his hands and his knees. He said, and he would have this huge robe over him. And his face would just be buried in the ground. And he said, as a little boy, I would sneak underneath the robe and, and put myself right in the um, crest of, who, of his body. So he was underneath his arms and his legs. And the robe would be covering him. And he would be crying out in the presence of God. He said, those were some of the sweetest moments I ever had with my father. And as he was telling me this story, I just got a picture of us. I got a picture of us. How we should crawl up under the arms of our father and tuck ourselves in. And not only was he tucked in the presence of God, but he was completely covered. Now, if anybody were to walk in the room, all they would hear was him crying out and then him covered in the presence of God under this robe. And that's what Jesus does to us. That's what he wants us to do is tuck ourselves under him and let him cover us and let him love us and let him empower us and let him be with us and just sense his presence all day long. It doesn't have to be something you just come in here on Sunday and begin to get stirred up because Naya tells you to lift your hands and worship him. You can have this every single day of your life, every single moment of your life. And this goes for the young. Yes. Goes for the young. Yes. It goes for the young, and I've seen it. I've seen it over and over and over again with my own eyes. And I commend you, fathers, 
and mothers in here that bring your children in here yes. and they encourage them to yes. go. Yes. Because I, when I tell you my children, and I call them mine because when I'm there, they're mine. The, <laughs> what, they were trembling in the presence of God. Oh, trembling. And I said, they're going to come in this church and our children are going to flip it over. Yeah. Our children are going to light this place on fire oh, because they're getting a hold of it. Yeah. And it's because you put them in position to get a hold of it. Yeah. And I thank you. I thank you for that. The scripture reads... And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit ye here while I shall pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And said unto them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Terry you hear and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto you. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. And that word Abba stuck out to me. And it's repeated three times in the, the New Testament. And Abba was a place of intimacy, a closeness. It would be like somebody coming up and saying, Daddy, Daddy. And Jesus, during this time in Gethsemane, Gethsemane means olive press. So it was a pressing time. It was a time where circumstances weren't all going Jesus' way. And there's times in our life where circumstances and situations aren't going to go our way. And we're not going to feel like following Jesus. Okay, I'm going to get real in here this morning if you would allow me to. Because there's going to be times that it's going to be so pressing then we're not going to understand why we're going through or facing or why would a father that loves us so much allow us to go through some of the things that we go through. But God is producing an exceeding weight of glory in you. He is producing something in you, a character in you that is irreplaceable. That is an eternal character in you. A good father disciplines his children. A good father teaches his children lessons. A good father is there in the good and there the bad but allows their child allows their child to walk through this process yeah. but you know what a good father never takes his eyes off his child mm -hmm. his eyes is always upon his child and that word father represents the closeness of relationship but what I love about this is Jesus said in the gospels that what I have received from the father I give to you so us as the children of God, we've been placed into Christ and whatever is Christ is ours. So when we're traveling through this process, you have the freedom, you have the liberty, you have healing, you have provision, you have all that you need to walk through this process and to go what you're to go through what you're going through in victory Amen. and not in defeat. You can travel through this in victory this morning because you have a good father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He made a covenant with his blood. He made a covenant and an agreement with his blood. That when you say yes to him and identify with him, he says you're mine. You're mine. You're mine. Praise you're God. mine. And you can use my name. You're mine and you can use my name. You're mine. You can use my name. When we say yes to him, he gives you power to use Amen. that name. Amen. Thank God. Hallelujah. He's adopted you. Right, right. He's adopted you. The Bible says you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Okay? Fear. False evidence appearing real. Fear. You don't have to fear anymore. You don't have to fear because you've been adopted. You've been adopted as a child of God. This is a legal work. It's legal. It was signed with the blood of Jesus. So when the enemy comes in like a flood, 
Hallelujah. You can use your father's name, hallelujah, to receive something, means to take hold of, to grab a hold of it. And this says, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption where we cry, Abba, Father. So what does that mean? You have received something. But when you receive something, it's like Naya coming up here and going to hand me something and I just drop it. See, when you receive something, you need to get a hold of it. You need to lay hold of it. It takes two. So when God is giving you something, you have to lay hold right. of it and receive it for yourself. Yes, or you're not going to have it. My Lord. It's been supplied. Yeah. But now you got to lay hold of it. And he said, I've given you the spirit of adoption. You are mine. Mm. So everything that the Lord has given you is an inheritance. And an inheritance is something that's been passed down after one dies. So Jesus, therefore, died on the cross. And now you can possess everything. Yes. You can possess everything that he has given you. You can possess restoration in your families. You can possess salvation for your children or for your loved ones. You can possess it by faith because it is your inheritance. And we need to start laying hold as children of God to the inheritance that has been given to us. And I know I fall short. I know when I'm in a pressing Gethsemane and I have to say, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And I don't understand why things are happening. I tend to forget what my father has purchased on Calvary. I tend to let go and not take hold of it myself. But taking hold of something is mean you're not going to let it go. You're not going to let it go. You're not going to let go of the promises of God. You're not going to let go what he died to give you. Think about that. What a great gift. What a great Father's Day gift. Hallelujah. But not only did he give you this inheritance, but he also gave you the spirit. Okay? So now it says in Galatians, the other time he uses Abba. And because you are sons... God sent forth his spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So not only have you been adopted, but you have been equipped. Think about it. Not only have you been adopted by the blood of Jesus and by a legal action, but you have been equipped by the spirit of God for this journey where in your heart it cries out, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. And what does that mean? What does that mean? It means a yearning. There is a yearning. There is a calling aloud. There is a place of a shriek or to entreat. That sounds to me like an emergency. And I was thinking, if, a, if you had one of your younger children, okay, Troy, you're out on the boat and Shep falls into the water with no swimmies on. I guarantee it doesn't even take you two seconds to get off the boat, to jump in the water, to pull them out. Right, right. And I was just thinking about how many times do we cry out to the Father yeah, and we yeah. might, might not see him moving like in front of us, but all of a sudden he's beginning to put things together and he hears it immediately. I guarantee you hear that shriek. You hear that cry immediately in an emergency and your Father comes running. He's immediately there. And the spirit within you bears witness that he's there. But there's times that the circumstances are so heavy and so trying that it begins to cloud our judgment and cloud our mind. And we begin to believe the lies that the enemy is telling us. But we have to know who we are in Christ. We have to know our position. I have been positioned in Christ. This is who I am. And I have the spirit of God living within me, drawing me closer to him and closer to him. Pastor Swagger said in his commentary, and I liked it, it said, God the Father sent his son that you would have your position in Christ. And he sent his spirit 
that you might experience the reality of Christ. That's good. Yes, yes. See, not only does he want you to be saved, but he wants you to experience him on a daily basis. He wants you to experience the reality of him, which his spirit is going to make real to you. His faithfulness, his provision for your life, his mercy for your life, his favor and his hand upon your life, his power in your life. He wants to make that real and evident as a good father would. As a good father would. Hallelujah. And the scripture says, Mark 14, 32, and they came to a place. See, I wanted to set the stage real quick. So you knew who you were. Because before you hit the garden, you got to know who you are. Before, before you hit that place of agonizing and pain, because I'm not going to sit here and um, paint a picture that Christianity is going to be something that's going to be super easy. Because it's not. And you know who most of the time gets in the way? It's us. We get in the way. And that's why the cry of the master's heart was, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. We're talking about the father's will. The father brought him to this place. The father did. Because there was something there that needed to be taught, not only to Christ at the time, but to his disciples that were watching. And it said, and they came to the place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit ye here while I shall pray. It wasn't just Jesus in the garden. His disciples were there. And what I love about that is the true followers of Jesus, those that are sold out, those that are willing to go, you're going to have a Gethsemane experience. And you probably won't just have one. We'll have many. Gethsemane experiences where we have to say, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. But those I looked back in the Old Testament and those like Daniel who was in the mouth of the lion's den, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And the mouth of the lions were shut. See, he's an on time God. So he's going to show up when a heart is truly for him. Yes. Moses on the backside of the desert. God showed up. Esther in the king's court when she said that if I perish, I perish. And she went in knowing that it would cost her life. But God showed up. Ruth, who said, I go where you go and I lodge where you lodge and I stay where, I, where you stay. She was blessed. She was blessed for being sold out to God. Paul, who was beaten and shipwrecked, he saw many and thousands come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And not only that, but wrote most of the New Testament. So God used him mightily, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. See, I'm talking about his disciples. Because we always say, I feel like sometimes we have this, this thought in our mind where we feel like things are supposed to be a certain way. But God chose through his sold out believers that you might go through a lion's den and you might get thrown in a fiery furnace, so to say. And you might be pressed in the olive press in the Garden of Gethsemane. And you might be exiled to the island of Patmos like John. Ever feel super alone like you're the only one? But God revealed the book of Revelations to him during that time. Mm -hmm. See, when we get alone with God, we allow God to do what he wants to do in us. He will begin to reveal himself through his spirit. Amen. And he will make it a reality, something you can hold on yes. to, something you can take hold of. This isn't just something we come in here and go through the motions and do every Sunday and every Wednesday and clock in and clock out and check out when we go to work. No, God wants to reveal himself in reality to us in school. He wants to reveal himself in power when you're walking down the street, when you're driving in your car and somebody cuts you off and you would have said a thing or two okay but let's get real we are real people going through some real things when we see our family members turn against us and leave us and exile us because they don't want anything to do with us because we're 
believers in Jesus Christ. Yeah. And not only believers, but we follow the message of the cross. Hallelujah. Okay, so we follow we follow the truth of God's word. Okay, and there's many that are called, but few who choose the way. And you are a part of the few. So get ready and buckle in for your Gethsemane. Amen. Because there's going to be some times you're going to have to say, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Amen. I'll be honest with you. Do you think that um, I'm from New Jersey, 10 minutes from the beach? I love to snowboard. And, and I'm just, I'll make this a lighter subject, but this is truth. I love to snowboard and I love to go to the beach. And the Lord has placed me here in Patterson, Louisiana, um, with a swamp. Okay, I can't get on a snowboard, okay, behind a boat. I guess I could, Robert, if you want to try it. We could get that working out. But honest to God, I would not live here. This isn't a place, and I love you guys, but this isn't like an ideal location that I would say, oh, yes, please, Lord, send me there. Okay, and I love to go to the beach. I can't go. It takes us four hours to get to the beach I gotta send up a whole trip okay and I'm just I'm making light of it but the reality is I wouldn't have chose this for myself I had to say okay God you brought me out here you wanted to teach me something you're still teaching me and you're using me here and there's so many times I want to put my hands in it and just go do what I want to do and become what I want to become and find somebody that I can marry and go, look, I'm going to get real with you this morning, okay? And go and go get somebody that I can just say, oh, that's nice, and make that work, okay? But God says, no. Go sit down and tarry for a while and learn something. Learn of me. Let me become real to you. Wow. I'm getting real this morning. I'll put myself out there because this is real Christianity. And we're going to go through some things this morning. But the Father takes a nothing and makes it a something. The Father takes a no one and makes us someone. A Father takes a mess and makes it beautiful. Okay, I met, some, I met someone recently and I told him my testimony. And he was like, I would have never have thought. I would have never have thought. And I, and I was like, it's just the Father. It's just the Father. He takes what seems so in insignificant. If you feel like you are insignificant in God's eyes this morning, I want you to look to the cross. I want you to look to the blood. I want you to look to what God did by sending his son and say, I am not insignificant at all. I am not insignificant at all.
thousands of people saved. Yes. See, he used Peter despite his weaknesses. So yes. stop looking at your weaknesses. Stop looking at your frailties because that will hinder the work of God that God wants to do in our lives. If I stood in the mirror and just thought about all the wrong things and everything I do wrong, it will hinder the work that God wants to do in my life. You look to him. Look what he can make you become. James was in the garden. He was very quick-tempered. He wanted to call down fire from heaven and burn everybody up. And he got rebuked by Jesus. And he was selfish and sought honor. See, but God saw him, and he was a part of the inner circle. See, God sees what you are, and he also sees your heart and what you're going to become and what he can do with you. So don't give up. Don't give up on your family. Don't give up on your neighbor. Don't give up on your children. Don't give up on the person next to you. Don't give up. Amen. And don't look at other people's inadequacies and be like, well, they're like this. See, God can use a donkey. Yeah. God can use a donkey. Then John was there, which was the brother of James, and he was also quick-tempered. He was one of the first disciples called, but the scripture says that they were unlearned and ignorant men. Unlearned and ignorant men. But God said, I want him. Yeah. I want her. I want him. I want her. Because I will take the foolish things and I will confound the wise. Yes, Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. He saw fit to draw these men into his inner circle. So at 12 a.m., here's Jesus, and he enters the Garden of Gethsemane, and they came to the place. God's going to draw you and bring you through some things with Jesus by your side, but it said they, all of his disciples, those men I just talked about, Peter, James, and John, with all their frailties and inadequacies, he's like, I'm going to take you with me. I want to take you with me to one of the most excruciating moments in Jesus's life. He wanted these three men with him. That's powerful to me that God would see fit to bring these three men with him. And he brought them to this place of surrender. When your will is swallowed up in the will of the masters, you are then called a bond slave. That's what Paul calls it. When your will is swallowed up in the will of the master. So whatever you have for me, God, whatever you want to do with me, God, wherever you want to take me, God, whatever you want to use me for, God, because there's not one greater than the other in, in God's kingdom. There's not one. I know the ladies when I walk into family worship center or even the, here that say greet people in the beginning. You know, sometimes people can look at that as the most insignificant job, but I think it's one of the most important jobs. Yes, yes. Welcoming people into the house of God. If you do not feel comfortable or loved when you walk into the house of God, there's a problem. Okay, so let's get out of our comfort zone sometimes. This is a side note. Let's get out of our comfort zones sometimes and say hi to somebody we might not know or give a hug to somebody or how about after altar call we don't just all run to our cars and we actually see how people are really doing and allow the spirit of God because each person is significant no one should walk into the church building and feel insignificant or unloved or unwelcomed we should all be welcoming and loving one another and I know the Lord has dealt with me on that time and time again to be welcoming and to be loving and not to let one go. Naya walked into a church down near LSU and she was walking the lake and she walked into the church to use the restroom and not one person said hello to her. Mm. Not one. She had to go find the restroom on her own and, every, and there was people in there. And no one said hello. No one introduced herself. And she walked out. She said, what a shame, Ange. What a shame. And let us not be like that. Let us allow the Lord to use us. So I'm saying not one is more important than the next. We're all important. 
And Jesus often came to the Gethsemane to pray. And this is a place where he came face to face with the will of God. You're going to come face to face with God's will for your life. And you're going to have to make a choice. Amen. You're going to have to make a choice. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Or I'm going to do my own thing. Yeah. There's no in between. There's only what he wants and what we want. And we and you can't muster up the courage to say I'm going to go God's way. No, you got to surrender. Hallelujah. You got to surrender your will. You got to surrender the way because the only thing that's going to change your heart is the grace and the power of God when a heart says I surrender. When the heart says I've been wrong and I need to change and I'm going to go this way, Lord. And this isn't a one time I get saved at the altar and that's the only time. No, this is a constant thing in the in a Christian's life. Repent and surrender and move forward. Repent and surrender and move forward and allow God to do the work in your heart. Yeah. And there's going to be times you're going to go around the mountain. Over and over and over around the mountain. <laughs> until you say, okay, I'm ready. And then there's going to be times where you think you surrendered. And then here it is yeah. again. <laughs> there, there it is again. Okay, Lord, I surrender it again, Lord. Obviously, there was some part of my heart that still wanted that thing. Or wanted that way. Or wanted whatever it was. There's still a desire in my heart to go the wrong direction, Lord. Help me again, Lord. Help me choose right. Help me to choose what you want. And to know that you withhold no good thing yes. from me. Yes. Yes. See, because the enemy will lie and say God's withholding something from you. Yes. <laughs> Can I get a witness? Yes. <laughs> God's withholding from you. God doesn't want good things for you. But those are lies. Those are false evidence appearing real before you. But it's, it's a lie. And you have to know the Father that you serve. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when you're walking and you're trusting and you're surrendering, there's a reliance that comes on the Spirit. There's a relationship Amen. that you get with your Father Amen. and a reliance upon the Spirit of God that you have to have yes. to walk this out, to, to go through the garden. And there's a pattern that's in the book of Mark. They have Passover, which is salvation, which represents salvation. And then they have the Lord's Supper. So we get saved. We have the Lord's Supper, which is we identify that I'm in Christ. I believe that I am positioned in him. I am bought with the blood of Jesus. I know this. I believe this. I'm in Christ. So now I have my identification, my position. But then we, as soon as there is the Passover and the Lord's Supper, you hit Gethsemane. It's back to back to back. And Gethsemane is a place of sanctification. It's a place of change. It's a place of pressing. It's a place of producing oil. So they say, not my will, but thy will be done. You have to surrender your own desires, your own plans, your own yeah. mindsets, your own agendas, your own ideas of how you think things should be. Amen. And they're not. Right, right. Lord, help yeah. us in yes, this Lord. place, yes, Lord. Lord. My own ways, I got to surrender to the Lord. My own belief systems, I, my own perceptions, my own assumptions, I have to constantly surrender to the Lord. Yes. And as you begin to surrender this to the Lord, ownership is thou transferred. You are no longer the owner of your own being. You're no longer the owner. He is your owner. That's he right. is your master. He is your leader. He is your, he is your father. And I love that because the love of a father is unlike anything else. And when you look at him as a father, you want to follow him. Sometimes we can look at the Lord and look at him as like a harsh taskmaster. And some of us, we didn't have such great upbringings. So sometimes our view of a, of a father can be tainted. And I understand that, but then God wants to renew our minds of what a father really is, what a good father really is, what a loving father really is. So they come into this place of an olive press, and I love this illustration, so follow me. When we're in the olive press, a farmer grabs a hold of an olive branch and taps it with a stick. So the olives fall to the ground. Well, we are the olives. And the farmer is Christ. 
When the olives fall to the ground, that is a place of surrendering our hearts to the Lord. But the farmer is careful when he's doing his work not to bruise the olives. So the Lord is always working in love. He's always working in a gentleness and he's always working in a kindness. He doesn't want to bruise the olive. Each olive is filled with half pure oil. So that tells me the Lord fills us with his spirit, but there's still a work that needs to be done. There's still a work that needs to be done in our hearts. And the farmer then begins to remove the pits of the olive. He begins to cleanse our heart. The Lord now takes that which needs to be cleansed and he begins to remove the pits and he puts them in a large basin. Now all, okay, all of the olives are now in a large basin and they're pressed down with a millstone that weighs a thousand pounds. 1,000 pounds. I can't, I can't even think about lifting that up. 1,000 pounds. Have you ever been through something that you feel like it's so heavy? Yeah, yeah. And you wake up heavy. You go to sleep heavy every day. It's heavy. It's on you. It's heavy. It's pressing. It's on you. It's heavy. It's there. It's there. It's there. And it feels like 1,000 pounds. Well, God is allowing that thing to press on. Now, sometimes it's just oppression and you need to tell the devil to flee in the name of Jesus. So you need to know the difference and God will teach us the difference when it's oppression of the enemy or when it's the Lord working through circumstances and situations. But what I love about that is that when he's pressing you, he's producing power. When he's pressing you, he's producing anointing. When he's pressing you, he's producing something that's going to help you travel through the pressing. And when the millstone is on top of the olives, the farmer puts a large stick in the middle and he turns it. Focus on the cross and he will give you the power to go through the process. Focus on Christ and he will give you the power to go through the process. But what happens is the farmer has the direction that it goes. And then he has the speed that it goes in. So I've ever been through something before and you're like, when is this trial going to end? When is this circumstance going to change? When is my heart just going to be free of this thing? When is my mindset not going to think this way anymore? But the father has control of every circumstance and every situation and the turning of the millstone and the turning of your life that he is producing glory in you. Mm. And then it's not over. As the oil flows into a container, they take which is left and they put it in baskets and they put 400 pound stones. So now you're traveling through and it's not as heavy as it used to be, but it's still heavy. Right, right. You're still going through the process, but it's still producing the beaten oil. It's called beaten oil and it's the best oil. See what God has for you is the best. But we have to travel through the process to get what he wants to give us. Because if we don't, we'll take it for granted. Yeah, right, right. And we'll use what God, whatever it is, we'll use it for our glory and not for his. Wow, yeah. So God wants to produce a bee in oil. And these oils are used for the anointing process The power process and the presence of God is then going to be evident in your life because you allowed him to bring you through this nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done process. Hallelujah. 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 And he tells his disciples, sit here while I pray. Settle down in this place and watch my example because you're going to have to go through too. Mm. Sit here a while and watch me. And what does Jesus do? He cries out, Abba, Father. And then he recognizes the character of God and says, I know that all things are possible for you. See, there's times in our life that we got to cry out, Father, 
help me. And I was saying it this morning. If God be for us, then who can be against us? And there, listen, get a hold of that. This isn't just a song we sing on Sunday morning. If God, that's scripture. That's written in the word of God. If God be for us, then who can be against us? See, and sometimes we come and we sit and we listen to the preaching and we listen to the word of God and the worship and you walk out the door and everything you just heard, it's like, oh, that was good. Yeah, that was good. And then we walk out and it's like, boom, and then whoop, it's gone. Amen. If God be for us, then who can be against us? And I'm preaching to myself because I got to remember this word. I got to remember these things. I got to remember to praise him in the pain. I got to remember to pray through the process. I got to remember these things. Because we forget when we're faced with a circumstance to pray during the testing. To praise during the testing. It's not because your father wants to hurt you. It's because your father wants to produce That's something right. in you. That's yes. right. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. And prayer Hallelujah. is critical. Prayer is critical. He said, sit here while I pray to the Father. That's telling me we better get on our faces and start crying. We should be a praying church. Yes, and not just praying here. Come in Nai and I were praying on the way here, and we were like, let there be an expectancy. Yes, Lord. There should be an expectancy that is produced in your home so that when you walk in those doors, there's a corporate expectancy. There should be, and if you don't have it, ask him for it because he'll produce it in you. God, light that fire again. God, light that again. Stir me again for when I was hungry for you, for when I was desperate for you. Do it again, Lord. I need it again because the circumstances have snuffed out my fire and I need you to light it again, Lord. Or even blessings. Be careful. When we're blessed, we tend to forget the, the garden. And God will be like, okay, let's bring it back to the garden again. Let's bring it back through some things again. And it's not because he's a harsh taskmaster. It's because he's a loving father. And he knows that if you go your way, you will destroy yourself. Oh, Lord. Yes, yes. So he wants to bring you his way. Amen. But you have to have relationship. Yes. Amen. And relationship is found tucking yourself in the crevice of your father and letting him speak to you in his word, letting him comfort you in prayer. Sometimes it's a war. Amen. Come on now. I mean, a lot of the times it's a war. You're warring for your soul. Yeah. But you're war and you're warring for your family souls. And you're warring for this is a war. Get your armor on. Let's get our armor on. War for each other. Yes, yes. I just recently seen on Facebook a friend, her father is super, super sick. And it's like, man, God touched that man. He's a man of God. He's a pastor. And he has cancer. And I'm like, Lord, raise him up. You can raise the dead. Do it again, Lord. We should be crying out for one another. We should be hurting with one another. We should be concerned with one another. Do it again, Lord. Hallelujah. And he takes Peter, James, and John and began to be sore, amazed, and very heavy. And said unto them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Tarry you here and watch. And he went forward a little, little and fell to the ground. This is Jesus. My God, yeah. Now this tells me that Jesus had emotion. <coughs> that Jesus was a real man. Yeah. That went through some real things. And Jesus being sore amazed meant that he was struck with terror and alarmment. Have you ever went through something and it's all like it's an instant thing, like it's all of a sudden it happens yeah. and you are just struck and paralyzed with terror and amazement that this is even happening. And then it produced a heaviness, which was a distress of the mind. A lot of the time the battle is in the mind yeah. and we need to redirect our thoughts to the word of God and what God about our life and what God says about who we are in Christ but that takes us stepping and getting in the presence
presence of God. But what I, Jesus was praying and facing these things. So don't let, when you get in your prayer closet, or you go to praise him, or you go to worship him, and all these things start flooding your mind, it's meant for you to run. It's meant for you to flee the presence of God so he can't do the work in you that he wants to do. I remember in Bible college, you would think in Bible college we'd be floating on clouds with angel wings, right? Well, in Bible college, I was going through a lot of, people think that, I was going went through a lot of different things and there was times I'll put myself out there I didn't show up for chapel and I would call I was the dorm leader I'm supposed to set an example <laughs> but I'm getting real there was Naya would say where are you like it's too much it's just too much okay because the enemy and I would I would succumb to the plan of the enemy and then she would text me later and be like it was so good the presence of God was so amazing I'm like well, well way to make me feel worse <laughs> I'd be wallowing in my bed come on yeah. right yeah. I was going through some things in Bible college trying to get and take a hold of everything that God had for me because he was preparing me to send me out and he wanted me to be touchable so he allowed me to go and, I, and that was my choice to wallow in my sorrows in my bed but he allowed me to go through some things that I can tell you get up yeah. out of your bed and come I don't care if you come to church in your pajamas lay down at the altar and let him get a hold of you so he can do something I should have went hair on top of my head makeup running down my face I mean it makes me laugh because I'm one of those like I don't cry very much you'll hear my cry but you don't I don't cry very much and those kids had me at that altar oh, Lord, yes. and I could cry I could cry now when they were trembling in the presence of God and I laid hands on Zeph, oh the power of God hit yes. me. Yes. I could not stop crying. Like, snot everywhere. I mean, it was embarrassing. It really was. And I'm like, Rhett, go get me tissues. He brings a whole box. And, and But well, you know what? We didn't get up. And there was times that I would, I was like, oh, this is embarrassing, Lord. And I was like, and I wanted to get up. But the Lord just kept saying, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. And I just kept praying. And there was even a time, okay, let's talk about the battle in prayer. I was once again with the kids at the altar, trembling and crying, second night in a row. And my voice closed up. Like, literally, I had to run and get water out of the sanctuary. I couldn't breathe. Like, my throat literally <laughs> closed up. And you can believe me or not believe me. I don't care what you believe. I lived it. And it was, and it was, I was like, oh. But God was doing something in these children. God was touching these children. And the enemy didn't want me to keep praying for them. But you know what I loved? When I came back, there was other children and workers surrounding. See, God don't need me. He don't need me to do what he wants to do in them. He chooses to use us, and I love that he does, but he doesn't need us. And God, hallelujah. I don't know how I got on that rabbit chair, but that was a good one. Oh, yeah, heavy. There can be a distress in the mind, and that's even what happened. I was scared when my throat closed up at that time. I was like, what is going on? But God met the need still. See, you might be facing something that's uncomfortable. You might be facing something that's very unfamiliar. And it might be producing an intense sadness or an overwhelmingness. But Satan at this time, Jesus was crying out and sweating drops of blood. Mm. Satan at this time was trying to take the life of Jesus. There's going to be times in our life that we're going to feel as though Satan is trying to take our lives. Mm. And he is. Mm. He's out for keeps. 
He's trying to keep your soul. He's trying to disturb and distort your faith. He's trying to take your faith away from you because he knows that faith produces grace and grace produces power and power produces your anointing and your anointing by the blood of Jesus Christ can flip this world upside down. And he tries to distort your faith and he tries to tempt you to go outside of the will of God because he knows if he can get you outside of the will of God that there's no power there. Amen. He tries to distract you from doing what God has called you to do and tries to destroy you in that place. But Naya sings this song, I've got the victory, hallelujah. I've got the victory, hallelujah. And then it goes, Satan's defeated, hallelujah. hallelujah. Satan's defeated, hallelujah. And sometimes you can feel like it's a like a kid's song. But when the kids began to sing it at IKC, we were jumping because Satan was defeated, yes. hallelujah. hallelujah. And it wasn't just something that was like a song that we sing. See, you got to start singing these songs when you come into church and believe yeah. what they're saying. Yeah. That Satan is defeated. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Because when you begin to believe it, it produces a faith inside of you that's going to carry you yes. through. Yes. And you can do it even in your home. Do it in your home. Do it in your car. They're going to think you're crazy. It's okay. Because when they open the door of the car or you step out of the car, the glory of God's going to follow you. Hallelujah. And it's going to hit them. So do it. Hallelujah. And Jesus commands his disciples, Terry here and watch. Terry where? In the garden. See, so many times we're in circumstances and we're like, I'm getting out of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. However I can figure out my way out, I'm out. Yeah. But God... Jesus tells his disciples, tarry there. Mm. Wow. That's where I want you to be. Mm. Tarry there in that given spot or state. Mm. Where? In the olive press. And watch, meaning stay alert and stay awake. Mm. Stay alert and stay awake. Jesus finds them sleeping. And so many times I looked, be careful what you say about the disciples. <clears throat> Because so many times I've, I've looked at this passage and be like, how could they fall asleep? Right, right. <laughs> Jesus was over there crying, sweating drops of blood. How could they? But you know what? Have you ever been so mentally, physically, spiritually exhausted that all you could do is just sleep? Mm -hmm. This was a point of emotional and physical exhaustion. Right. It was a spiritual <laughs> battle. That they were facing. And they were right in the midst of it. And they found themselves in this condition. But God says for us to stay focused. To stay awake. Awake to stay alert. In the Greek text it indicates that later on they were asleep. Not deliberately. But because the oppression was so sorrowful. Mm -hmm. That's what it indicates in the Greek there has been times that the oppression or depression in our life has been so sorrowful that we find ourselves even in a natural place wanting to sleep or even in a spiritual place wanting to sleep. But God says no to get in his presence. What did Jesus do? Let's see what Jesus did. Because there was a great work that was about to take place. So get ready. Because when God is about to do something great, there is a battle that is before it. And there's a battle that's after it. So, But the battle that is before, when God is about to move in such a great way, can be so intense to stop the move of God and what God is about to do. And Jesus was about to go to the cross. He was about to perform the greatest work and to mankind. And the enemy was trying to oppress him so much. And there's times I'm sure that he even seen with his eye what he was going to go through. Have you ever been in that position where you just keep seeing it over and over and over again? And it tries to stop you from moving forward in the things of God. But you serve a great God. You serve a mighty God. You serve a faithful father. You serve a... See, you got to begin to proclaim those things and declare those things over my life, over your life. No, my God is all powerful. My God is all knowing. My God is omnipotent. My, you have to begin to proclaim who he is in your life and he will be made more real. The Spirit of God, when you proclaim who He is, will make Himself real to you as what you proclaim.
proclaim him as. And Jesus, what happens? Because the disciples are sleeping. So what happens to Jesus? Jesus is continuously praying, but it indicates that he's falling to the ground. Jesus is falling to the ground, but Jesus doesn't stop crying out to the Father. So there's going to be times in our life that we have to continuously keep crying out in desperation and in our yes, struggle yes. to the father. He is not intimidated by your struggle. He is not intimidated by what you're facing. He is not intimidated by the sin. He's not intimidated by the mindset. He wants to change it. That's so we right. just got to surrender it to him. And even if you got to fall down, if there's been times I've been in fetal position on my, on the floor of my bedroom, weeping and crying like a baby and just asking God to do it. Yeah. Just asking yeah. him to do it. He's not intimidated by the condition that you're in when you're going through it. He wants to meet you in the need because he's a good father. I know there's not a moment that you would see your child weeping on the ground and not go and try to comfort them or pick them up. Or sometimes if it's their own fault, you'll let them sit in it for a minute and let them get through some things. But God, but you're always watching. You know when your child's in trouble. You know when your child's in need. And the father is always always there watching and ready to meet that need and he falls repeatedly agonizing in prayer and what does he say what does Jesus say Jesus says that this hour might pass he says Abba father all things are possible unto thee take away this cup from me Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He knew the father had the ability to change the circumstance in the situation, but he knew what he had to do to save humanity. And you're a part of that process. We are a part of that process. As God produces power in you and produces his anointing in you through circumstances and situations, when you, when he is made real to you and you go tell somebody about it, they know the genuineness. They sense the presence of God. They sense the anointing of God. They sense there's something different about this one. There's something different. And God is producing that in you. So Jesus was about to grow, go to the cross. But he knew he needed the grace of God and all God supplied to carry out this will. That's right. Amen. Even Jesus needed to rely on the spirit of God to carry out the will of the Father. Amen. We need the spirit of God to carry out the will of the Father. You need a constant flow of his spirit, not just a little drop. You need a constant flow over and over and over and over. And over again to carry out the will of God and recognize the God that you serve. Naya, if you would please um, come up. Hallelujah. If y'all would stand with me. Hallelujah. God wants to, God is up to something today. Yes, Lord. God is on the move today. And I don't know how you felt when you came in or what you're facing at home or what you're going through, but I like there is you need to know who your father is this morning you need to know the God that you serve but if you're in that place where you have to say nevertheless not my will but thy will be done because I know this is your will father I know this is your will father I know who I serve but God I gotta surrender God I gotta surrender because I need your grace I need your grace to produce in me what you want to produce in me. I need that power that I know that you can give me. Hallelujah. If that's you today and you just need to surrender and lay some things down and express faith in your father, come express faith in your father this morning and let him make himself a reality to you.